many. All right. Glory to God. If you have your Bibles this morning, I hope that you do because uh, Justin's not here to put it on the screen today. So if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to do a little turning, but I'm going to try to just uh, not do a whole lot of turning for you. Maybe I can just kind of hit these and I'm going to stay on the platform a good bit this morning. Um, Psalm 78 and verse 40. He's talking about, the writer's talking about the children of Israel as God brought them out of Egypt. He brought them out of bondage. It was a type and a shadow. The Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the New Testament, the New Covenant. It's just, there's types and shadows all through there. Spiritual things, you should always look for them. Ask God to show them to you, reveal them to you. And there's many I've never seen, but anyway, he said, uh, How often did they, the Israelites, provoke him, God, in the wilderness? They were out there for 40 years. It was because of the first, first little bit that they stayed out there 40 years. Uh, we'll touch that in a minute, but he said, How often did they provoke God in the wilderness? And they grieved him. You know, people can still grieve him today. You know, he's to be honored. He's to be reverenced. But anyway, uh, he said they, they grieved him in the desert. Yea, it said they turned back. Well, they never went back to Egypt, but their heart turned back. And they, they got disgruntled with God because things wasn't going the way they thought they should have. Well, they, they could have went right in. It was just, a, I think, 11 days' journey from Egypt into the Promised Land. But yet, they didn't have faith. After all God done for them in Egypt, after all the signs, wonders, and miracles, and He brought them through the Red Sea, that was a type and a shadow of Him taking our sins away. Egypt was bondage, which sin is bondage. And so when they came through the Red Sea, all that He had to do to get them through there he brought the greatest nation, the greatest army on the face of the earth at that time. He brought them to their knees and, and killed a majority of them. And they come through on the other side. You know, how much more do you have to see to trust God? Knowing that he'd done that to bring you out. Anyway, it said they tempted God. They turned back in their hearts because they never went back to Egypt. Some of them, they wanted to. They wanted to say, let's, let's go back to Egypt. We're going to die in this wilderness. But they never did. But in their heart, they never got away from the old ways. They never got away from the ways of the world, if you will, and got over into the kingdom of God the way God does things. said they turned back, tempted God, and they limited Him. They limited the Holy One of Israel. I know none of us are limiting God in any way, are we? I mean, you know, he's, he's doing everything in our life that's possibly within His capability. I don't think so. Um, I think there's a whole lot of limiting going on, and I'm not innocent. But I'm getting, I'm working at it. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not His hand, nor the day when He delivered them from the enemy, which was Egypt. You know, the greatest thing God can deliver us from is our sins. I mean, that's, I mean, if you die sick and go to heaven, at least you got delivered from your sins, but that's not God's will either. His will is not for us to get... I don't know where we got it, where it come from that uh, we're supposed to die sick. You have to get sick to die. Paul didn't die sick. He didn't. He didn't say he did. It didn't say Peter died sick. Yeah, their body got older, and yes, it did wear down some, but uh, the Bible doesn't teach us that we have to get sick to die. Paul said, I finished my course. At one time, he said, I, I'm not ready to go yet. He said, I think it's more needful for me to stay here with you. He said, I'm, you know, I want to go and be with the Lord, but I want to stay here with you. He said, no, I think I'll just, I choose to stay. I'm just going to stay. I'm the one making the choice. But then when he got ready, when he finished what he felt like he could do, maybe his body had slowed down, but, but uh, he said, I, I finished my course. I have run my race and finished my course, and now it's time for me to depart. And there was others more than him. But, but the greatest thing that, that God could do if we ever need to look back and see God's hand where it worked for us, 
Look back when the Lord set you free. Now, you know, Brother Arthur, he, uh, Brother Arthur Reynolds, he would, he'd catch you on the street. He'd catch anybody anywhere, and uh, he'd reach out and shake the hand. But one of the first things he wanted to know, it wasn't going to be far in the conversation. He said, can you take me to the place and tell me the time when the Lord saved you? You know what? He didn't mean that uh, you had to have the very day or the very hour. I do. Mine was March the 5th, 1978, about 7 o'clock in the evening. I can remember the spot in the floor I was standing, almost. When the Lord, He delivered me. He delivered me. I was changed from then on. I was, I've never been the same, but I've always been after it. I've made some mistakes, but I've always been after it. I've tried not to limit God in that area, but I can look back. That was a miraculous miracle for me. Trying to come off of drugs and alcohol, and I couldn't. But when I gave, I got tired of that. It wasn't that I still wanted it. I just got tired of it. I couldn't get away from it. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, he came in and I got a brand new nature. And I walked away from it that day. I've never desired in my heart to go back. Yeah, I've missed the mark a couple of times, maybe six months or so after I got started. But I realized real quick, it wasn't just a, just a minute. And I said, take me back. I don't, I don't need this. This is what I come out from. I had changed, but that was the greatest miracle that ever happened in my life. Now, I've seen all kind of miracles healing in my body. They said I deal with the rest of my life. I've seen great financial miracles happen in my life, but the greatest miracle is when the Lord saved me. I can, if nothing else ever happened beyond that point, I could look back and say, I remember when the Lord saved me. They used to have a song like it. I remember when the Lord saved me. But that's a great miracle. The day he brought them through the water, through the Red Sea, was the same thing. It was a great miracle. But look at all the miracles he'd done in Egypt before he brought them through the Red Sea. He had to bring them up to that point to cause them to let them go. And, of course, the last plague he brought was the firstborn of every man and beast died that night. The death angel came. And, of course, we know that was a representation where they took and eat of the lamb, and that was... Uh, Spotless, that was like Jesus. That was a representation of Him. And we won't go back and look at all these scriptures for time this morning, but back in uh, Exodus, as God led them out of Egypt, in the, I think it's the 17th chapter of Exodus, He said, uh, God led them to a place called Rephidim. And one day the Lord, I heard Him, this has been many years ago, He said, uh, Turned to, I believe it's the 17th chapter of Exodus. And I turned there and I started, I could tell it was just the Lord prompting me. I went to the book of Exodus chapter 17 and I began to read and I read through there and I just didn't see it. And I said, Lord, if that was you, I, I don't see what you're trying to tell me. And I could hear him in my spirit saying, in my thoughts, he said, go read it again. And I think I read it for it was at least five or six times. And finally, I noticed it right at the very starting of the chapter. He said, God led them there. You know, they went to a place and, and it was bad. It wasn't good. It said, he led them to a place called Rephidim and there was no water in that place. See, God wanted to show up and show them, I'm the life. I mean, I'm the one that's going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. There was no water in that place. And so God told Moses to take that rod that was in his hand that's what Moses had was a rod we don't have a rod anymore God didn't give us a stick when we got born again uh, he gave us our mouth our heart to receive his word it's already in there it come with the package but we have to believe it enough for it to start to, we start declaring it out of our mouth but anyway he told Moses he said take that rod and strike this rock which was a type of Jesus and he struck that rock, and out of that rock, I don't know how big that rock was, never tried to study how big it was, but out of that rock flowed a river of living water, of fresh water. You know, that's a type and a shadow of Jesus. And it said that rock followed them. There's places in the Old Testament, it said that rock followed them through the desert. I've never really studied uh, anything about that that much, but that rock followed them, and water came out of it. But uh, he told him to strike that rock. He was trying to show them, I'm almighty God, and I can do anything. It said it was a flint rock. 
I guess, I guess that's, the, you know, that's the type of rock. You know, we used to have these, uh, uh, what was it? Not a big lighter, but a Zeppo. Man, that was the stuff you had a, one of them metal Zeppo lighters to light your cigarettes with. You'd flip that thing and you'd have to put new flint in it. I don't know if that's the same type. I guess it is a flint rock. But uh, it couldn't have been any moisture in it, could it? If it was a, if that had anything to do with a flint rock, if it's the same thing. But anyway, he caused enough water to come out there for them to drink for 40 years. Every time they needed water, water came out of that rock and it fed millions of people, their animals and everything. You know, I can remember Tammy and I about to get married and when we got married, Lord God, we didn't have, we had nothing. But I knew and she knew. We were just drawn to one another and we knew we were supposed to get married. I mean, anybody in their right mind would say, look, let's, uh, I think Tammy had left her job at uh, Columbus at the Aflac. That's when the, all those killings, stocking killings were going on and I don't know, it, it doesn't matter. She wasn't there anymore. And uh, at that, right at that moment when we decided we'd get married, all of a sudden, I didn't have a job anymore. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of stuff going on. You know, anybody in their right mind would have just said, uh, hey, we need, to put this, we need to put this down the road until things get better and, uh, you know, we need to put this off. But, you know, thank God neither one of us had enough sense to, to try to figure that out. We just trusted God. And neither one of us, I didn't. I know I didn't, and I don't believe Tammy did either. We did not have a clue where we were going to live. My daddy asked, he said, boy, how in the world are you going to make it? And you know, I was just young enough, my heart was full enough, I was just like these, these boys, a few of them there, like Joshua and Caleb and like Abraham and like David. In a sense, I just believed God, I just trusted God. I said, Daddy, I don't, I don't know, we'll get us a place somewhere. I don't know, all I know is God has put us together and He will make a way. So that was, uh, I think, around October of 1979 when we decided we were going to get married and we set a date of February the 1st, 1980. We didn't really meet till probably August. Well, the muscadimes was on the vine whenever they, it's in the fall, so they're not ready yet. Uh, I don't know when they come out, probably it may have been October. But I mean, we didn't put this thing off at all. We just, we just went forward with it. And uh, it's been good. I mean, yes, yeah, sometimes we went through some knot holes, but she's hung on and I drug her through there. But God's always took care of us. But, you know, he took care of us. He gave us a place to live and said, you can live there as long as you want to. We didn't have to pay a dime. It don't matter how it come. I didn't have a clue. It just came. And, and I, the next thing you know, I had a job. And then Tammy had a job. And neither one of them was real good, but we had each other. As people say, we was living off of love. But God was taking care of us. And I remember trying to get to this point I remember looking at her back then and telling her before it all happened. I knew it was, we just knew, we didn't know how it was going to happen or what, but we just knew. I remember looking at her and telling her, if we can get through this, I said, I didn't have a clue. I said, I will never in my life ever worry about God taking care of us again. If he can get us through this, why, why, else, why would we worry anymore? I mean, we were up against all odds. There was no possible way for us to make it. I mean, we wasn't living in high rises. We wasn't living in all luxury. But I remember telling her, I said, if, when we get, if, if, we, if we get through with this, I'll never wonder, doubt, consider again where the God's going to take care of us. If he can do this, he can do anything. But I, little did I know. And, you know, you get caught up in life and you get your mind off of God and you get your mind on building your life instead of his kingdom. And you get yourself in some tights. You do things that the Lord didn't tell you to do. You just figure, well, God's going to take care of it. Well, he lets you learn by hard knocks sometimes. So uh, it's best to listen to the Lord. In Numbers, they had uh, finally got over to Canaan land. Moses was living. They were about to go over. And God told Moses, he said, send men from each tribe, 12 men. Send them over there and let them spy out Canaan land. And let them come back and bring a good report. 
He wanted them to come back and tell all the Israelites, man, you should have seen this land. Oh, and you know, it said two of them, they found one cluster of grapes, and it said it took two of them to tote it. They cut a little tree or whatever, a limb, big limb or something, but it had to be heavy enough. It said it took two men to tote one cluster of grapes. There were giants in the land, and everything was just, it was god size, I guess. And so they came back and they showed them. They said, man, and they did. They said, my God, it's just like God said. It's flowing with milk and honey. Well, how milk and honey, uh, you, there's got to be plenty of green grass for the cows to eat. The cows have to be fat, and they have to be putting off plenty of milk, don't they? And for there to be plenty of honey, there's got to be plenty of green grass and, and you know, flowers growing for the honeybees to go out and get that nectar and make honey. They said it is truly a land flowing with milk and honey. They said, it is a good land. But, they said, we always get our butt in the way, don't we? Numbers 13, verse um, 28, it said, but the people living there, they said, yeah, the land, just like God said, but the obstacles that we got to go up against, they're bigger than us. The people are living there. They're powerful. This is some big problems. And their towns are large and fortified. Like Jericho. It said when they went over to take Jericho, 40 years later, when Joshua led them in, it said the, the cities were walled up to heaven, as they said. They, was able, they were able to ride chariots around. They had houses on top of the wall. The walls were so thick. There was no way for anybody to penetrate that. No way. It'd be hard for them to penetrate it. I guess we got plenty of stuff we could blow it down today, but they had nothing like that back then. There was no possible way. And they went out there and they saw that. They said the cities are walled up to heaven. There's no way for us to get in. The people are powerful. The towns are large and fortified. And said there's giants over there. There's some big, we can't deal with them. Just like David, it went up against Goliath. He came out, it said, for 40 days Goliath came out. Morning and evening and challenged them. Said, send me out a man that'll come out here and fight with me. And whoever wins, if, if, if I win, then you Israelites will serve the Philistines. If you win, then the Philistines will serve the Israelites. Didn't never work that way. David destroyed them. He cut Goliath's head off, but still... Uh, and they killed them, a bunch of them that day, but they still didn't yield to them. They did in, in certain times, but anyway. So uh, they run into problem, didn't they? God sent them out. They went over there for 40 days, and they searched that land out. And they brought, it'd be like taking 12 people, ministers maybe, if you will, and sending them in, in the Bible, the promised land. It holds all of God's promises, Right? We're not, God's promise is not a physical land. He wants to bless us in the land. He said He blesses us from anything we put our hand to, but there's types and shadows. The Word of God holds all the promises of God. And now that we're in the New Covenant, the New Testament, it said now all the promises of God are yes and amen. So be it. They belong to you. So all of them came back, 10 of them out of 12, 10 came back and said... They brought up an evil report of the land. They said, anybody that goes over there in that land said, it will eat up the inhabitants of there. You can't take that land. Those people will eat you up, and you can't take their cities. But there was two young fellows there, and they'd been hanging close to Moses. Uh, you find jo uh, Joshua, he was in the temple with him. He went up on the mountain with him when he, when he saw God, but... Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb said he stood up and he told them, Hey, y'all be quiet. Hush. I've got a different report than you do. I see all those giants. I see those cities. But I'm looking at God also. I'm not looking at how big the problems are. I'm looking at what our God said. You know, he told Abram, he was making him Abraham. You know, he didn't have any children. And he was now 100 and Sarah was 90. And God told him, he said, uh, I'm changing your name 
from Abram to Abraham, which meant a multitude, have to be a father of a multitude, other things in there. But he said, you're going to have a multitude of children. And change Sarah's name also. And God said, he didn't say, I'm going to make you. He said, I have made you a father of many. I've done it. It's an already done deal. I believe with all every ounce of my being. Abram tried to get out of come, becoming Abraham. He said, uh, he said he had a young boy. He was probably a teenager by then, or right at a teenager. Ishmael, he had raised him up. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter if it come by Hagar. That's still his, his blood. That was his boy. And he loved him. And he said, it sounds like this is what he was saying. He said, he said God, just let Ishmael be my descendant. Just let Ishmael be my descendant. What's that saying? I just don't know if I can believe you for that, God. That's just a little bit too hard for me to believe. What's, what would it say? What do you think it's saying for, for Abraham, God to tell him, change your name to a father of a multitude, and he's a hundred, and Sarah's ninety, and he's got a boy already he's raised up, and, and he's raising him up to, to be his heir. And he said, just let, let's just let Ishmael do it. What's that saying? I just don't know if I can believe for that, God. That's just, a, you know, I've been looking at them stars. I've been looking at the sand of the sea for, for 25 years now, and I hadn't seen a thing. I'm still childless, me and Sarah. But God demanded him to change his name, so he had to start declaring what God said. He had to believe in his heart. It, finally, he heard God enough, and he said, I have made you. I'm not going to make you. I have. I believe to this day, if Abram would have never become an Abraham and declared it out of his mouth, it never would have happened. We'd have been reading about somebody else today. But he had to get it in his heart. He had to hear what God said. Faith cometh by hearing. It came the same way then as it does now. He heard it and he finally embraced it and God commanded him to change his name and he had to start saying or just get in flat disgrace and honor with God. But he started saying out of his mouth, I am a father of many, a father of a multitude. You know, the more you say it, you know, you're going to believe what you say more than anybody. And the more he said it, I guess, the bigger it got. And, uh, I guess it was just within a few months that this thing happened because uh, it said in about a year's time, they said about the length that it takes a woman to get pregnant and have a child. So at about 100 years old, it didn't say he was 101. So this thing had to take place pretty quick. Both of them changed their name. They had to start saying out of their mouth what God said. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm positive if people of God would, would get in this word enough and spend more time in here than they do anywhere else, they'd get that in there and it'd start changing what their vision of their self and their surroundings and that, that, this would start coming out of your mouth and it would start changing the direction of your life and it will change what happens in your life. But anyway, that's what Abram had to do. And Caleb and Joshua were on the same, I mean, they were young men. They were right at 40 years old, I guess, when this happened. And Caleb came up and said, Hey, y'all be quiet, hush. They said, he said, be quiet, we're well able to go in and take this land. We're able to do it. Don't you remember what God has done for us? That's where he was at. He wasn't looking how big the giants was. He thought about, look what happened at the Red Sea. Look what happened to the armies of Egypt. And it's the same God. Look at the water that's come out of the rock while we've been coming over here. Caleb, it said, he wholly followed the Lord completely. And I got to move on. Time is rolling, isn't it? So 12 men went over there for 40 days and they searched out the land of Cana. And it was exactly like God said. But they came back and, it, and they told the story that it's there, but we can't have it. We're not big enough to go get it. Our God's not big enough. Apparently, they didn't believe God was for them. And so it said the whole nation of people it said they cried all night long. We have come out of Egypt. We've left our homes. We've, 
We've left everything and come out here and give our all for God. And now he's brought us over here to let us die in battle. And they cried all night long. And God heard it. And he didn't like it. I know we're under grace, but uh, we can still, we can quench the Spirit of God. We can stop the hand of God. Let me see where I want to pick up. Let's see, verse 30, verse 30 of Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, 30, it said, But Caleb said, We can certainly conquer it. 31, he went on, he said, But the other men disagreed. This is out of the New Living Testament. He said, They're stronger than we are. They brought a bad report. And verse 33, they said, They saw the giants there. And it said, Next to them, we were in our own sight and in their sight, them looking at us, we were like grasshoppers to them. You know what you can do with a grasshopper, don't you? You just reach over and you can match one if you want to. I mean, they're not a threat. And that's what they were saying. They said, we're just like grasshoppers. But Caleb and Joshua saw it the other way around. It just depends on who's looking at it. You know, people get born again. And then they start trying to operate in faith. And they say, well, I'm believing. I've been, I mean, I've been believing. And sometimes things do take time, especially if other people are involved. But either we're believing with unwavering faith or either we're not. I mean, there's a law of faith like a law of gravity. It's going to work every time. If it works, uh, if it works over here, but it won't work over there, then that's what you call, what's that, a phenomenon? But the law of faith is just like the law of gravity. It's going to work the same no matter where you are. It's going to work. The law of faith, if it's perfected, if our faith is unwavering, if we get all the doubt and unbelief out, how many times did the Lord say, only believe? What's he saying, only believe? He's saying, don't, don't look at anything else. Don't look at the circumstances. Look at what I said. What did God say to Abram? What did he say to them? He said, I have given you the land. My angels are going over before you into the land, and they're going to drive out the people before you. And when they went over there and searched the land out, when they went in and Rahab was there, she told them, she said, All their, their heart has melted. There's no fight left in them. They've heard of what your God has done to the armies of Egypt and all the miracles he's done. She's saying, y'all could have just walked in here and took it because there's no fight left in them. And the walls of Jericho, when they came, they just fell down in front of them. That's, who, that's the God we serve. He's big, but we limit him. We constantly are limiting our God. We need to find out what did he say in his word and the Bible says, and I believe it just as well as it's written, God can not lie. He can't lie. Everything he says comes to pass, but he has to have us working in conjunction with his word. We have to declare his word and believe it and start acting like it. The Bible says, and it's true, faith without works is dead. You know, it says that even the devils believe in Jesus and who he is, but... Uh, they're not going to get saved. There's people today that they're religious, but they don't, they've never, they know who Jesus is, but they've never committed their life to him. Well, not right now. I just, I don't think I'm ready right now. And a lot of the times, some of these people are so messed up. I was there one time, and I think, man, what is it you're afraid to give up? I mean, look at their life, especially with drugs and alcohol, and I was there too. What in the world are they afraid they're going to lose by giving their heart to Jesus? The, the devil's just got them deceived. He had me deceived. But they said, we can't because we're like grasshoppers. That's, that's the vision they had. That's, who, that's how they saw their problems, and that's the way people see them today. But we have to fight against that. We have, as the Bible said, we have to fight the good fight of faith. The only good fight of faith I know is the fight that wins. That's if you don't quit. Winners never quit, and quitters never win.
You know, they went on, they said, let us choose us a leader and let's go back to Egypt. What were they doing? They were painting a picture of defeat. The longer, the more they talked, the worse it got. And they said, we just wish we'd have died in Egypt. Wish we'd have just died out here in this wilderness rather than to go over there in that land and get killed by them giants. And they said, God heard what they said. And you know what they said? That's what they believed in their heart. That's what they said out of their mouth. And God said, basically, he said, you're going to have what you say. And that's what they had. And then some of them decided, well, we will go over there. No, we don't want to stay out here for 40 years. He said, you're going to serve in that desert one year for every day you was in, in Canaan land. No, we don't want to do that. We can go in now. It was too late for them then. It was too late. They couldn't go in. Thank God we're under grace today. If I'd have been living back in that time, I'd have probably been one of them that got swallowed up in the ground. You know, the earth opened up about then and swallowed them. Just, they just got them. I'd have probably been one of them. But I'm not. Thank God I'm not. So their heart, they just couldn't see it in their heart. They still had the ways of Egypt in their heart. They still just couldn't see that God was a good God and he wanted to be good to them. Because he hadn't been there in 400 years. They'd been slaves. That's what they, they had slave mentality. This is what we are. And we, we're not an army. We can't defeat them. They never learned to trust God. Let's learn to trust God, folks. Let's learn to trust God. Let's learn to take him at his word. It may not happen for you overnight. It may not, but you know one thing is for sure. If we don't try, it'll never happen. He's not going to just come down and hit, say, well, I'm going to just fix Bruce today. I'm going to hit him with the twang stick and, and just fix his life. I've been in it over 40 years, and it just don't happen that way. There must be a reason it said that uh, without faith it's impossible to please God because we can't do the task that he wants us to do. If if we're not using faith. That's the only way we can receive what God has for us is by faith. But you know what? There was two fellows and they stayed in there for 40 years. They saw it. Moses told Joshua he had been in and he had scoped out the land. Each one of them went to a different area in Canaan land. And Joshua, I'm sure Joshua too had just told about Caleb, said, Caleb went out and searched out the land, the area that he was to search out, and he came back, and even though they wasn't going in, Moses told him, according to the word of the Lord, that when you do go in, if you'll wait, when you do go in, you can have that piece of land is yours for the taking. All you have to do is go in and take it. You know what? Joshua and Caleb, they just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And they did not lose their vision, even though they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now see, they were outnumbered. There were 10 of them, and uh, I guess you'd call that a, what, a democratic type government? 10 of them voted that uh, God's not big enough to take us in. He brought us over here to die. And only two of them, they said, no, we can do it. But those 10 held the other two back for 40 years. Years, but they didn't give up on God. They saw, hey, why die here in this wilderness? The rest of them died off. Every one of them above the age of 20 died in the wilderness. And then their kids that came up behind them, they were learning from their parents. And, and he said, you're doing the same thing they did. But yet they got to go in. The kids did. But Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of all those people. But they kept their faith. They did not waver just because they'd got well Joshua said the time they went in Joshua said he, he was 40 years old but he, when it come time for him to go take his mountain, Josh, Caleb said I'm sorry Caleb, Caleb said I'm 85 years old now and he said I'm just the man that I was when we went over 40 years ago, 45 and Joshua said well go hey and he reminded him. He hadn't forgot what God had said through Moses. He hung on to the word of God. He said, this is what God said. That that's my mountain. That's my piece of property. And Joshua said, hey, I remember. You go get it. That's yours. Go get it. And you know what? Caleb went over there and took his piece of land. But years on down the road, when Joshua was getting ready to die, they were still tribes, if you will, 
it was 12 of them, I forget how many, quite a few that still had not gone in and possessed their property. They were still hanging around with the rest of them, but they had not gone in and took the property. And so Joshua encouraged them to go take it, but some of them took the property, but they weren't able to overcome all of them, and it said they were like a thorn in the side to them the whole time. They still didn't trust God enough. But the people that will trust God, people say, well, I don't, you know, I, I, just, I don't know why this is not working. As I've said before, how long have you been saying that? You know, I've had to catch myself at times. I just, you kind of like you lose your hope, you lose your vision. But, you know, you have to do like David did one day, and you have to stir yourself up and say, no, I'm not going to lose my vision. This is what God said, and that's what I'm going to have. I'm not going to give up on it. We cannot give up on the vision God has put in our heart. He never starts anything not to finish it. He intends to finish it. Uh, we may not be around to see the end of the result if, if we don't stay in faith, but somebody will. If we don't get in there and do it, he'll wait and move us out of the way or wait till we're gone and he'll bring somebody else. God's going to have what he, what he determines to be done. It will come to pass. Because, see, he don't quit. He doesn't give up. He doesn't lose his vision. Let's don't lose our vision in our own life in our church, for our community. God set us here to make a difference in this community. All I know is, is I'm more excited now than I have been in a very long time. That we're growing. I can see it. We're growing by leaps and bounds. This church is growing. And I'm excited about it. I have got to close. Let me see where I just need to grab and go. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, it said the, uh, I won't get all the verses, I'll just touch them. It just said that the word preached to them. Back then, it was a promise. God had promised them they could go in and have the land. It said a word, the, the word preached to them did them no good. It didn't profit them. Because it was not mixed with faith. See, faith without works is dead. I mean, you, you know, I can meet somebody on the street that I don't know, and uh, somebody else could tell me, oh, they're they good for their word. But if I don't know them, I may be willing to trust them a little ways, but I may not be willing to trust them with my life. And so they heard the word, but it said they wasn't willing to trust God. And they said the word didn't, it didn't, did them no good because they wouldn't mix it with faith in them that heard it. And it goes on down in verse 3, and it said, uh, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You've heard me say it many times. It, it just boggles my mind, but sometimes I wonder if we're much better than them. We are. We can have it. It said, Before the foundation of the world, God had things planned out. This was a generation that was supposed to go in and possess it. But they never did. And some of their children that went in never really possessed what God had for them. Only a few tribes really went in and, and took the land like they were supposed to and trusted God to the utmost. But he said this was settled and finished. The gospel was finished before the foundation of the world. But they never entered into it. He said, labor therefore, Hebrews 4 and 11, labor therefore, if you want to labor for something, he said, labor to enter into this rest that God's going to be there with you. That Jesus took care of your sin. You can't get there by trying to keep the law. He said, for the word. Well, let me just read. He said, therefore, enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. It says somewhere in the New Testament that all those things were written back there in the Old Testament. They were kept up with and written for our examples that we could look at and learn from. He said, for the word of God is alive and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides our spirit, our soul, and our body. The word of God is what does it. But there's so much stuff out there to grab our attention. I've kind of got to this point right here in my life that... Uh, until I see everything, and I've seen a lot of things happen in my life. I've seen the gifts of the Spirit operating in my life, but they hadn't, they're not working fluently like they did in Jesus. And I've come to the point in my life that 
I think, well, uh, there's a lot of things that I can be doing, a lot of things I can do to have fun, but the, the things that I've done that I've had the, the most fun at is watching God work miracles in people's lives. Not to see miracles, but to have compassion on somebody. See God raising people up off of deathbeds. See people have demons cast out of them. That It's amazing. That's fun. I think, you know, there's plenty of things I can get tied up in. But until I see this working in my life like it was in Jesus' life in the apostles, what am I going to put first? Amen? Just because we don't see other people doing it, it doesn't mean it's not true. I'm here to challenge you. Every time I come up here, I'm going to challenge you because I'm always being challenged by Him. That's not to knock us over the head and, and be, feel condemned, but get in the Word and look at it and let it change your vision of who you are, what's on the inside of you, what we should be doing. It's not hard. It's just not hard at all. It's just so many other things in this world we're trying to hold on to. He said you can't serve the kingdom of God and the world at the same time. You can't do it. But Jesus said if you'll serve the kingdom, He said all these things you're trying to get, He said they'll just come to you. They'll come to you. If we have a home, it just come to us. Nicer than any home I ever believed for, to be honest with you. He said He'd do exceeding abundantly above all we'd ever ask or think. And I'm not bragging at this because I didn't do it. But we're living in a home nicer than I ever thought we'd be living in. And Tammy and I didn't pay for it. Nobody paid for it but God. I was able to sell the home that we were in. Once I got that sold, I was able to take that money and put it back in there that was used to buy it. So it wasn't our money. It wasn't our inheritance money. It was God that took care of it. He done it. He said, put me first. And I can't say that I had everything perfectly in line, but my heart was there. My heart was there. I'll have to close there. I was going to tell you a little bit about David, but I won't. I don't have time. I'm out of time. Uh, let's just don't limit God. Let's don't limit God. I mean, this church is built around the theme of getting the Word of God off of the page into your heart until you believe it so much it starts coming out of your mouth and you start declaring what God said. And then and only then can it become a working reality in your life. You know, there's types and shadows all in there. David went down to the brook when he went out against Goliath and he got him five smooth stones and he put them in his pouch and he took one out and he put it in his sling and the Holy Spirit got a hold to it. David wasn't that strong. He wasn't that perfect. I'm sure he was good out there watching those sheep. He could probably wound that thing up and sling it, but you know God had to get involved when he run down to that big Philistine. He saw, he saw the future before it happened. He declared it. He said, this day, I'm going to cut your head off. And I'm going to give your carcasses to the wild birds. Today, this is what's going to happen. He said, I don't come to you with a man's ability. I come to you in the name of the Lord, of the God of, of Israel. That's how I come. He took that stone and that sling. It's like us getting the word of God in our heart and it coming out of our mouth. You know, until it comes out of our mouth, it can't do anything. As long as it's on that page, it can't do anything. But when it comes out of our mouth, it's just like Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They're living. They're alive. The word of God is alive, it said, didn't it? They're alive. And they can change things. And the Holy Spirit gets involved with God's word. He's not going to get involved with just something I say. But if I say what God says, they're going to back it up. Amen? All right, that's enough. Father, we thank you today for your holy written word.